And again, like I was uh, starting to say, thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting us back again, my son and my daughter. This was an honor song that we were just bringing in due to I had my daughter singing this year at the beginning due to the, the movement of the women's rights because of the violence and everything amongst our women, no matter what race or where we come from. Also, it hurts just like the violence against our men folk also. We got to keep things united. And like we say, there's a lot of hurt in this world today. The things that come from all over, no matter what the problems are. But like King and all of them, in all the speeches that he made and went around and did, sitting in jail, fighting out of jail, fighting the rights of the movement, keeping everything united. We know the problems and the issues that we went through. I was myself, like we said, in all kinds of things in school and stuff because of my braids. These are the different things that we see because all creeds and colors carry their, their heart, the way they were raised, what they believe in, that stands up to that right of the things that the people believe in. When we unite as one, like the man said, as long as there's one or two that believe in the things that there, the miracles can take place. But it's within ourselves that we bring, that we lift up ourselves, opening our hearts to the matters, just like King and the rest of them went out to do. He, he even said and stated, his dream is still moving as of today, every hour, every minute. Same thing with the Kennedy brothers and all those that was before us and before them. In all creeds and colors, people hurt because we all come from different areas, cross seas, cross mountains, because everybody heard of America being the land of the free. Everybody wanted that, but yet when they reached here, they still feel the, the troublesomes of all the racisms throughout the, the world, not just one country, not just one place, all over the place. And this is what we fight every day, every morning in our children. We know the things that happen in schools, outside schools, anywhere, like we said earlier, just because of the way we look, just because the way we dress, just because of the way we speak, we are all one in the eyes of the Lord. And this is what we unite as. Others never think that the racism like King and all of them still talked about in time, that he even, his, his passing said, it will be seen yet. And we fight things. People fight with other things and issues to bring up and bring the heart and the mind to one thing. And that's why as spiritual people, we are all that. Just like the, med, the coat of many colors, that represents all of us as one. Because when one bleeds, we all bleed. This is America. We used to always said, God blessed America. I think he has to come back one more time and bless it. Thank you. Amen, baby. <laughs> Warm welcome to you all, Pastor Chris here at St. Paul Lutheran Church. Privileged to share just an opening invocation with you this evening. For the first time in about 50 years, a major film producer has produced a film. Some of you probably know, Selma. Maybe some of you have seen it. If you haven't, it'll be in Missoula, I think, for a little while. First major film about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In a recent interview with Jim Wallace from Sojourners, the lead actor, David Oyelowo, was interviewed and asked some questions uh, about making the film. David uh, felt a calling upon his heart in about 2007 that 
He felt God was calling him to play the part of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, it seemed like others didn't have that same message. He got passed by, turned down for that role. But as the film progressed through its own challenges and hurdles to be made, he did finally literally get the phone call and from the director and said, I need you for this part. A Christian man himself, David, uh, had modeled his life after the sacrificial love of Jesus. And as he continued to study for the part for Martin Luther King Jr., he was moved by King's desire and will and passion to be a person of sacrificial love. And indeed, that continued to inspire him throughout the making of the film and continues to inspire him today and lifts that up for all of us as just a reminder of the power of one willing to sacrifice, in some cases, their very life for the well-being of another. That's a big sacrifice, but we can sacrifice in so many ways, and with words and with actions, with prayers, and with other things as well, and whatever callings might be on our hearts and in our lives. Of course, in the news a lot is Pope Francis, uh, a prayer that's attributed to Francis of Assisi, who has inspired the Catholic Pope. Words for us to reflect, uh, words for us to think about this night as we go forward. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. And where there is injury, pardon. And where there is discord, union. And where there is doubt, faith. And where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born anew. Thank you for being here tonight. Let us continue our journey. Hello everyone, how's it going? Happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. little gospel for you today.
Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank Mr. Andre Floyd again. Mr. Floyd has played on stages across the globe while working with incredible artists such as Taj Mahal, Edgar Winter, Corky Siegel, and many more. Not only has Andre been a magnificent performer for more than 40 years, he is also a renowned concert promoter and has produced over 30 CDs for other regional artists. In short, Mr. Floyd is a quintessential musician and businessman. Andre is currently touring and pleasing audiences all over the Northwest with his original brand of powerful blues, while still finding studio time to complete his fourth CD on his own label, Tapas Records. Thank you. At this time, I'd also like to recognize NCBI Missoula for facilitating the Martin Luther King Jr. Day Planning Committee, which has organized today's events and we certainly could not proceed without a very, very special thank you to St. Paul Lutheran Church. All of these entities and so many more have joined together to give us this opportunity to honor the accomplishments of the Civil Rights Movement. Accomplishments that have been centuries in the making. From 1619, when the first slave ship reached our shores in Jamestown, Virginia, to 2015, when the United States Supreme Court has decided to hear arguments around same-sex marriage. This historic event reminds me of the 15-year run from 1940 to 1955, where our nation's top court heard 32 cases argued by the late Justice Thurgood Marshall, who won 29 of those cases en route to dismantling overt interstate racism and separate but equal injustice in education. Fitting events that deserve consideration in light of our theme for tonight, True peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And before we proceed any further, I also want to sing out and say thank you again to Pastor Chris for helping us open up today's proceedings. And I had written down his last name, was going to use that. I said, heck, if a guy introduces himself with his own first name, I should do the same. Thank you, Pastor Chris. <laughs> And certainly can't forget Ben Corral. Thank you for leading the march to the church and giving us a very, very warming introduction to help us get things kicked off. Now I'm happy to introduce Jamar Galbraith, who will provide a tribute to our dearly departed sister, Maya Angelou. Jamar has served tirelessly to help make tonight a reality as a member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day Committee, in addition to his responsibilities as a burgeoning star in the field of diversity and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Jamar Galbraith. Good evening. Try that one more time. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Much better. Um, first, uh, can we give all of you um, a round of applause for braving the elements and uh, helping to make today very special? Okay. Um, Margaret Ann Johnson was born on April 4th, 1928, in St. Louis, Louis, Missouri. The name that we have come to know her as, Maya Angelou, came about from one of her many and diverse careers. Over the course of her life, Dr. Angelou was known as a poet, a singer, a dancer, an author, an actress, and a humanitarian. At an early age, Dr. Angelou understood the power and weight that her voice could carry. 
After undergoing sexual abuse by her mother's boyfriend at the age of eight, she told her brother, which led to her assailant's arrest. He was found guilty, but was released after serving only a day in jail. Four days later, he was found murdered. And Dr. Angela believed that it was her indictment that ultimately led to his death. And as a result, she took a vow of silence that she wouldn't break until a teacher and family friend introduced her to literature and helped to demonstrate to the young Dr. Angelo that words have just as much potential to heal as they do to harm. Dr. Angelo's works led to her forming friendships with civil rights icons such as Malcolm X and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In 1993, she became the first poet since Robert Frost to make an inaugural recitation where she recited her poem on the pulse of the morning on behalf of President Clinton. Dr. Angelo's accolades are extensive as she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, a Tony Award, and three Grammys. She has been awarded over 50 degrees as well. Uh, in honor of Dr. Maya Angelou this evening, I'll be sharing with you um, a poem that she wrote called A Brave and Startling Truth. Just give me a second to make sure I get my pages right so I'm not reading you all the wrong order here. A Brave and Startling Truth. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, Traveling through casual space, past aloof stars across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible and imperative that we learn a brave and startling truth. And when we come to it, to the day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from the fists of hostility and allow the pure air to cool our palms, when we come to it, when the curtains fall on the minstrel show of hate and faces suited with scorn are scrubbed clean, when battlefields and coliseum no longer rake our unique and particular sons and daughters up with the bruised and bloody grass to lie in identical plots in foreign soil, when auspicious storms of churches, the screaming racket and temples have ceased, when the pennants are waving gaily and when the banners of the world tremble stoutly in the good, clean breeze, when we come to it, when we let the rifles fall from our shoulders and children dress their dolls in flags of truth, when landmines of death have been removed and the age can walk into evenings of peace, when religious ritual is not perfumed by the incense of burning flesh and childhood dreams are not kicked awake by nightmares of abuse, when we come to it, then we will confess that not the pyramids with their stones, with their stones set in mysterious perfection nor the gardens of Babylon hanging as eternal beauty in our collective memory, not the Grand Canyon kindled into delicious color by western sunset, nor the Danube flowing its blue soul into Europe, not the sacred peak of Mount Fuji stretching to the rising sun, neither Father Amazon nor Mother Mississippi who without favor nurture all creatures in the depths and on the shores, that these are not the only wonders of the world. When we come to it, we, this people, on this minuscule and kithless globe, who reach daily for the bomb and blade and dagger, yet who petition in the dark for tokens of peace, we, this people, on this moat of matter, in whose mouths abide cantankerous words which challenge our very existence, yet out of those same mouths come songs of sweet, as, exquisite sweetness that the heart falters in its labor and the body is quieted into awe. We, this people, on this small, and drifting planet, whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living, yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness that the haughty neck is happy to bow and the proud back is glad to bend. Out of such chaos, of such contradiction, we learn that we are neither devils nor divine. When we come to it, we this people on this wayward floating body created on this earth of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and woman can live freely without St. Simonius piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when and only when we come to it. Thank you.
And to go along with uh, the poem that was just recited, um, and the poem by uh, Dr. Maya Angelou, uh, the past year, 2014, was a year that was riddled with, um, with violence, uh, senseless violence, senseless acts of violence, whether through war, whether through brutality, whether through retaliation. Um, people lost their lives as a result of violence. And so if you all would please join me in just a moment of silence uh, to honor the souls of those that have departed as a result of these senseless acts of violence. Thank you. Wow. Zipping right along. <clears throat> it's, it gives me great pleasure. Oh, first, you know, I see about a dozen people standing up around the corners of this place. And I see some spaces, uh, there are few and far in between, but I've got some people helping out, raising hands. Please, come forward. I don't know if there's anybody standing in the stairway or not, but we've got enough room for all the people that I see standing to come up and sit down. Please, come on up. All right, and you stragglers, I can still hold this up for another couple of minutes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Just a couple more. So once again, it gives me great pleasure to prepare you for our keynote address. Rosalind LaPierre is the first and still solitary Blackfeet tribal member ever to be hired in a tenure track position at the University of Montana. Growing up in an era of activism, she's been a tireless supporter of the American Indian movement, addressing issues such as sovereignty, racism, and economic independence. She also extolled the likes of Cesar Chavez, the great civil rights organizer who formed the National Farm Workers Association, which would later become the foundation of the United Farm Workers Union. Ms. LaPierre believes that her life is a reflection of the Cesar Chavez quote, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. Please welcome Rosalind LaPierre. Thank you. So before I begin, I want to thank the uh, organizers, which I think most of you guys are sitting over here, right? The organizers of today's event and today's celebration. It really is an honor for me to speak today to everybody. And I also, before I begin, I would also like to recognize the Salish people um, whose land we are now mostly sitting, I'm standing, on, and uh, whose land we are using as part of our participation for today's celebration. So. Today I'm going to be speaking about environmental justice in Montana. I apologize at the beginning, I'm going to be reading my comments because we have a very short amount of time and as you learned from the introduction, I teach at the University of Montana and as some of you young folk realize, teachers love to talk. <laughs> And if I didn't have notes with me, I would just keep talking and talking. And I talk louder the more children talk about me. So anyway, so I'll be reading most of my comments. So today is a day that is set aside to remember the past, celebrate the present, and look toward the future. Today we remember the Civil Rights Movement and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We also celebrate the diversity of Missoula and Montana and we look toward the future and opportunities for more collective action. The Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice as, quote, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, sex, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Okay. 
kind of a long definition, right? So what it basically means is two things. One, that all people, regardless of who you are, all people have the right to two things. One, fair treatment, and two, meaningful involvement um, in relation to any environmental issue or concern in your community. Unfortunately, the citizens of Montana, especially low-income, Native American, and vulnerable communities, have been the victims of environmental racism and environmental injustice. Let me begin by reminding us of our own collective history and how we got to where we are today. Last year, Montana celebrated its 150th anniversary as a territory and a state. During the past 150 years, Montana's economy was based on the extraction and removal of our natural resources. This still is a major part of our economy today. It was an unsustainable linear economy. Just like the coal trains we see traveling through Missoula every day, everything that was extracted left the state on a one-way ticket out of town. It began with Buffalo. Buffalo were hunted to near extinction in Montana. Their hides fueled the industrial development of America by becoming belts for factories, and their bones became fertilizer for agriculture. Their loss and its impact on the lives of Native American communities in Montana was devastating. Then came the mining of gold, copper, and other minerals. The owners of these mines took advantage and exploited the new immigrants who came from around the world. They mined without any environmental regulations. And while the owners got rich, the health and well-being of these new Montana citizens were destroyed. And the landscapes were scarred forever. <coughs> then came the removal of trees. The oldest cottonwood trees along the Missouri River were cut and used to fuel steamboats. The forests of western Montana and those across the Northwest were clear-cut to help build America, America's railroads and cities. 150 years later, the cottonwood trees, which many Native groups view as sacred icons, have yet to recover. Then came the discovery of oil and gas. Oil and gas exploitation and extraction in Montana has occurred now for over 100 years. In that time, two billion barrels of oil has been extracted, leaving Montana's rich farm and ranch lands riddled with abandoned roads that crisscross the prairies and thousands of abandoned test drill sites and wells. Then came the mining of coal. Tribal lands in Montana have some of the largest coal deposits in the United States, and coal mining is destroying their landscape impacting their traditional lifeways, ruining wildlife habitat, and polluting their waterways. There's a lot more that I can add to this list, <laughs> just to lay it, but I'm stopping here. Um, such as the impact of industrial farming, haven't talked about that, or the damming of our rivers. But I kind of think you get the point. Montana has always been a place where corporations and even our own governments extracted our natural resources, and exploited our own people. Leaving behind a ruined environment, polluted communities, and unhealthy citizens. Montana, and especially native and vulnerable communities, have always been viewed as sacrifice zones to build America's empire. Now we're entering a new era, that what some people call extreme extraction. We can no longer get natural resources as easily as we used to, so we are now taking extreme measures such as coal bed methane extraction and hydraulic fracturing, both of which are permanently contaminating our waters and doing unmeasurable harm to our environment. We are now facing a time that political scholar Michael Clare calls the race for what is left. So, at this point, you're probably wondering, what the heck does any of this have to do with Martin Luther King Jr. Day? Yes? <laughs> I'll get there in a little bit. So, As the world competes 
for in this race for what is left, Montana will continue to be at the center of this competition. Corporations and governments will continue to come to Montana to extract oil, gas, coal, minerals, water, wind is the new one, of course, and the land itself. And as scholars such as Michael Clare point out, most of the resources in this race for what is left are on native people's territories. And as this competition increases, so will societal conflict between different classes, between different ethnic groups, different communities, and even between nation states. All we have to do is look up the road here with the proposed water compact with the Salish and Kootenai tribes to remind it of this conflict. The Canadian journalist Naomi Klein recently wrote a book called This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. If you have not taken the opportunity to read that book, it just came out this fall, please uh, read it. It's a great book. Her book is a discussion of the current situation regarding the seriousness of our unsustainability of natural resource extraction, fossil fuel use, and climate change. But despite the gloomy com you know, uh, content of her book, the majority of her book is to illuminate the opportunities to make change in our world and to look optimistically toward the future so that we can begin acting collectively. In her book, Klein challenges her readers to act, she posits the question, when history knocked on your door, did you answer? And I think that's an important question for today's celebration, to consider that question again. When history knocked on your door, did you answer? The Environmental Protection Agency states that environmental justice will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, work, and learn. As I've just outlined, unfortunately, during the past 150 years, Montana and its most vulnerable communities, native communities, new immigrants, and rural communities, have been the victims of environmental racism and environmental injustice. The people in communities of Montana have not either, one, been treated fairly, or two, been given the opportunity to have meaningful involvement in the environmental decisions that are made in the state of Montana. So now, what does any of this have to do with Martin Luther King Jr. Day? <laughs> I'll attempt to answer that question. So, as part of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement, two things stand out. One is, it broke down racial, ethnic, and class boundaries where different groups came together for the common good. And it strengthened collective action as a method for social change. In the search for social justice, it is a model for success that all Montanans can emulate. During the civil rights movement, hundreds of thousands of people answered Noemi Klein's question. When history knocked on your door, did you answer? We are now at a historic point in our own history as a state. Our challenge is different, though, and it is a challenge that impacts everyone in the state of Montana, just not particular communities. In many Native American societies, there's a philosophy that leadership considers the impact of decision-making seven generations into the future. When Go Governor Schweitzer spoke at the dedication of the Payne Family Native American Center at the University of Montana, he observed that it has been seven generations since Montana's founding. He commented that Montana would be a different place today if our forebearers had planned Montana's future with the thought of what it be would be like for us. Today, we need to borrow from that same ancient philosophy of Native peoples. So that seven generations from now, Montanans will look back 
and recall that this was the time that Montanans of all walks of life came together through collective action and worked to avoid societal conflict, to establish a path toward a sustainable economy, and to restore Montana to a clean and healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. LaPierre. Now, we are so fortunate to have the benefit of being entertained by a couple of our well-known and talented performers, Simone Fielding and Eden Atwood. that just a second. So while we're taking care of that mic thing, oh, I'm, now I'm out. <laughs> Hello. Volunteers 
will be passing a hat for any contribution you can and would like to make to ensure this event continues in the future. There will be a community meal following the program and separate donations to help cover the cost of food and will be accepted in the lower level. No contribution is too minimal and are all graciously appreciated. Wow, that's entertainment. Yeah. <clears throat> Many of you know that Eden is a musician, an actress, and an activist who has an extremely successful stage career. She's toured the world and chooses to live and teach right here in Missoula. And as you've just heard, Simone is one of her prized prodigies, an incredibly talented fifth grader who's already serving the community as a big sister. <laughs> Thank you. 
So now we've come to a portion of this evening's festivities that I know many of you have been waiting for, the Youth Art and Essay Presentation. Tonight we have some terrific young people who will take over the show and make those presentations. And when they come up, they'll tell you who they are and My name, my name is Michaela Hansen. I'm a junior at Big Sky High School. I got involved as a youth leader in middle school as a member of NCBI's after school program, EPIC. Empowering people, inspiring change. NCBI is a local er area nonprofit that empowers individuals through leadership development to end mistreatment of all groups and create a safe and welcoming community. I then joined their teen board their teen board, Youth Advisory Council. I continued working with them and went to their summer camp, Train the Trainer Camp. Then I learned the skills to co-lead and peer lead violence prevention workshops across Montana. I love this work because I feel like we get a chance to have a voice because a lot of times within schools, teachers don't let us really talk about the things we wanna talk about or just get up there and be a leader for our peers around us. And I, and, and I am Steeler Hansen, Makeda's little brother. I am in fourth grade at Hawthorne Elementary School. I got involved as a youth leader at my school this year through NC Brown's newest boys only after school program, Be Rad, which stands for Bo Boys Respecting All Diversity. I like Be Rad because we get to make new friends and meet new people. I really enjoy playing soccer, football, and Minecraft, and I really like my three dogs and my mom. My favorite thing about youth leadership is how we all work together and celebrate. Collaborate. Collaborate. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm in the fourth grade. I go to Lowell Elementary School, and I'm in Epic. Hi, my name is Lily. I go to Lowell School. I'm in fourth grade, and I'm in Epic. So me and Steeler have the great honor, while well, with our friends over here, of presenting the awards for this year's Youth Art and Essay Contest. Every year, the Missoulian newspaper and UM Excellent Fund join the MLK Committee in sponsoring an essay and art contest for students to showcase their creativity and thoughts in response to a quote of Dr. King. The artwork and essays of the contest winners have been published in today's copy of the Missoulian. This, this year's contest receives some really amazing artwork and writing work. Although the committee could only pick a limit number of awards, we want to honor and recognize all who entered this contest. The, the committee was truly inspired and it was in awe at the incredible talent and vision of our community's young people. Thank you. We will first announce the winners of the art portion of the contest. I will call out the names of the first, second, and third place winners for each age category. Then you, will then you will all come on stage together to receive your rewards. All the, work all the winning artwork will be projected to my right. The, the winner and the winner and the only entry 
this year for preschool through second grade art is Zachary Austin Everett. <laughs> the winners for third grade through fifth grade are our third place, Sydney Evgen, second place, Tesli Linusquist, and first place, Tegan Twig. The winners for sixth through eighth, eighth grade are our second place, Relan Gamble, and first place, Courtney Logan. So sorry if I totally butcher this name. Just throwing that out there. The winners for ninth through twelfth grade are, are a tie for third place. Sierra Cyber and Cora Fecks the next price. Um Susu Ooh. And first place, Ellie Bardsley. And now we are going to welcome up the winner of this year's essay contest. We will once again welcome the group for each category up at one time, but the first place winner will then read their essay for us and we'll move on to the next category. The winner and only entry for the preschool second grade, Lucy Reed. Hello, my name is Lucy Reed, and I'm going to read a speech that I wrote about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. really liked justice. I found out what justice is by asking people I know in my life. Justice was when a black man was elected president. Justice was Justice is returning books that we borrow from the library so other people can read them too. Justice is building a playground for everyone to use, like Silver Summit All Abilities Park. Justice is taking turns in a line or in a card game like Gin Rummy. <laughs> Justice is playing by the rules and being a good sport even when we don't win. Justice is a friend telling a boy to stop. Justice is being able to get married to your same gender. Justice is women and blacks being able to vote. Justice is nurses helping people with Ebola. 
Justice is big and small. Justice is not just for me. Justice is for everyone. Through fifth grade are third place Cyrus Keeley. Second place Nanya Ian Rasmussen. First place, Peter Seal Star. Stand. Hello, my name is Pilar Salston, and I'm going to today read you my poem. Until today, solid bands of tension, constant wars, arguments, and hatred fill up our world. We have no room for peace or greatness. We make bad decisions, then lie and give others our burden with blame. We blame each other for deeds never done. With all the unjust actions in our world, there is no room for peace. Until today. Today we will be hungry for peace and justice. We will conquer the battle of the races. We will give women their rights and freedom. We will change our world and its cruel doings. With someone in Montana, Missoula, who understands that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. Until today. Today we will gather around and push ourselves to full potential, and we will be victorious. The winner for 6th through 8th grade are, are a tie for 3rd place, Sophia Wallace and John Snowdrift. <laughs> 2nd place, Grace Gibson Snyder. First place, Zoe Wilson. Hi, I'm Zoe Wilson, and I will be reading an essay I wrote. Our country is fraught with racial tension. This points to a lack of justice in our system. To find true peace, we must address the inequalities and refuse to accept the injustices that are embedded in our society. In black communities, there's a growing fear of police and mistrust in the justice system. I used to think that the police were our protectors, saving us from bad people. But now, when I look at Michael Brown's death and the death of countless others who have died at the hands of police, I'm forced to question my assumption. When police officers are not indicted for killing unarmed men, we should question, what is the root of this problem? Does the prevalence of guns, combined with racism and fear, lead people to shoot first, ask later? Think of Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy shot in Cleveland on November 22nd in a park. He was holding a fake gun. Think of Eric Gardner, choked to death. Again, the officer responsible was not indicted. These deaths were unwarranted, and the lack of justice in responsible was unacceptable. This has to stop. Tension in this country is becoming more intense as attention is brought to the problem. This may lead to positive change. Like in the Civil Rights Movement, when Dr. King helped to end segregation, racial tension had reached a boiling point and positive change happened. 
Change requires us to speak out, question systems of justice, and demand equal treatment for all. Thank you. And our final category is ninth through twelfth grade essays. Third place, Michaela Brunet. Second place, Shelby Knight. Can, can, hmm? In first place, Spencer Chaffee Haley. Sorry, not that short. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Spencer Chaffee Haley. I'll be reading you a poem I wrote entitled Quenching Hatred's Flame. The world is on fire burning with endless singular passions. Our hearts are all wrapped up in razor wire. To possess is more important than to grow. We want, we want, we want cease, undaunted by the desires of one. Let coals and embers burn in your belly, but don't scorch your respect. Let hatred be done. Humanity is a continuum of every shade all the same, and yet for their color some were hung. We rage, we rage, we rage, release. All are created equal. We hear the mantra go. Threats and enemies in war and peace, at birth or on death row, give them their due. For the welfare of the many outweighs that of the few. We squabble, we quarrel, we've had countless fights. Brothers, sisters, and cousins alike. Not sexuality, gender, nor color. Nulls basic human rights. I am me, you are you, as we are human through and through. Thank you. Congratulations to all the contest winners and thank you to all who participated. I'm going to do a Phil Oaks tune. Anybody familiar with Phil Oaks? Yeah. I learned it today, so I have to see the lyrics.
And I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone. And I won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone. And I can't even suffer from the pain when I'm gone. Can't say who's to bless and who's to blame when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. I won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone. And the evenings and the mornings will be one when I'm gone. Can't be singing louder than the guns when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm All my days won't be dancers of the light when I'm gone. And the sands will be shifting from my sight when I'm gone. And I can add my name into the fight when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. And I won't be laughing at the lies when I'm gone. And I can't question how or when or why when I'm gone. Can't live proud enough that I can die when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Please thank Mr. Floyd again. And I also want to mention uh, my fine youth MCs and the presenters. Please thank them. As we approach the close of our program, I'd like to again thank the Martin Luther King Jr. Day Planning Committee and the St. Paul Lutheran Church. Please take a moment to review our sponsors listed in the program, and I ask that you please patronize them whenever possible. I'd like to mention a special thank you to the Missoulian Humanities Montana, and the University of Montana Excellence Fund. And finally, I leave you with this thought. The Reverend Dr. King once said that we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thanks to the environmental justice movement and King's influence on many of its early leaders, that stream in a utopian future that we can build can carry clean water for all, even the most disenfranchised among us. Thank you. I invite you again to uh, please join us downstairs for a social hour. Thank you very much.